Okay, Discus USA. We have decided to play very positionally with black. And there's nothing quite as solid and positional as the Queen's Gambit. As you guys know, I play the King's Indian, but at the first part of the speed run, we're gonna play very solid opening. So D4, D5, he goes G3. Fian catoing the bishop. It's not a particularly uh, dangerous line. It's not, it's not a terrible line. Um, and there's nothing that we should do in particular other than just to develop our pieces. So we're gonna develop our pieces. And as you know, in the Queen's Gambit declined, you go C4, E6, well, Bishop H3, okay. So yesterday I discussed a little bit about the sort of the philosophy of Fian Kettering the Bishop and the drawbacks of Fian Kettering the Bishop. And he's uh, really illustrating the drawbacks for us. He goes Bishop H3, offering a trade of bishops. Should we accept this trade? Yeah, it's, yeah, definitely. Because, because now he's got these holes immediately on, on the light squares. And... Uh, this is a very favorable trade for us. If I were playing normally, I would consider quickly running the H-pawn down the board, but let's, let's stick to the fundamentals here. And remember that uh, white is not doing anything in the center. And already he's got a very awkward knight. Let's, first of all, let's make a note to ourselves that this knight is undefended. So we should be looking for various forks and various moves like queen c8. It's not that effective right now. But um, if we wanted to make a greater claim in the center, there's no reason that we can't play c5 ourselves, right? It's like we're almost playing a queen's gambit ourselves with black, um, and it's the same mechanism. We're trying to displace the pawn, and if the pawn takes our pawn, well, I'll show this after the game. I guess is he will take the pawn. Um, and as in the queen's gambit accepted for white, we have the exact same ways of trying to recapture this pawn and gaining control of the center. Okay, so bishop e3 by our opponent is, is an awkward move. It's, again, he isn't doing anything horrible yet, but things are definitely not looking great for him. So I guess he's trying to, well, he's trying to support his central pawn. What should we do here? We can definitely take on d4, but then he centralizes his bishop. I don't really want to help him in that way. So again, when in doubt, there's nothing specific that should be done. Let's just develop our knight to c6. And again, we're trying to provoke him into taking on, on c5. Okay, go c3. He's actually not playing that badly here. Okay. So now we can continue our development in, in several different ways. Because he's developed quite awkwardly, um, we can consider opening up the center just a little bit with the move e5. But again, I'm going to continue playing super, super solid chess. I'm actually going to play e6. We're going to keep the center relatively closed deliberately because I want to show you guys how to play those resulting positions. He goes dc5, now he takes, okay. Um, now, I guess that was the idea of bishop e3, was to tie himself to that pawn. Now, um, let me think about this for a second. So there's a couple of approaches that we could take here once again, and a lot of you guys are proposing an excellent move here, which is to play knight g4, hitting the bishop, threatening to ruin white's pawn structure. But the secondary point of this move is that if the bishop moves away, we take on c5, we regain the pawn, and we're in phen phenomenal shape. Um, so these positions may be unfamiliar to some of you with, with pawns on c5 like that. White can play the move b2 to b4. You'll see this often uh, in many different types of positions. He goes bishop g5. That's a good move. How should we respond to this? How should we respond to this? Yeah, so never play f6, right? Except when you play f6. And the point of f6 is to attack the bishop. We need to make a move with tempo so that when his bishop moves, we can immediately take on c5. Now, okay, so we can also delay bishop takes c5 and make what additional move? exploiting the bishop being on f4. Oh, GM and Feingold is in the chat. <laughs> That's hilarious. Ben is in the chat. That's actually so funny. What's up, Ben? Exactly. So e5 would be a very tempting move. But again, I'm going to hold myself back. What is the drawback of a move like e5? Which, by the way, is an excellent move. But nonetheless, if you had to name a drawback of that move, what, what is it? It's that it weakens light. It weakens the light squares. It weakens f f5 and e6. It also weakens the, the d5 pawn. 
And in the name of playing solidly, we're going to take on c5. We're going to keep the center solid, and we're going to keep the light squares protected. Um, he's probably going to castle. This guy's not playing badly um, at all. So, of course, there's probably at, at several points we could have played slightly more accurately, but so far we're just playing solid joke. Because so b4 attacks the bishop. Let's keep the bishop on this diagonal, bishop b6. Okay, b5. Where should we go? Yeah, so we should keep the knight closer to the center. Knight e7 is fine. I like knight e5. I like situations where the knights are linked. And, uh, you know, there's nothing, you know, amazing about this move or nothing amazingly deep. The knight could go to c4 from here. Thank you, and best six. But the bottom line is he's not developing his pieces. And by pushing his pawn to b5, he's making a lot more weaknesses on his queen side. Now, but this pawn is backward and isolated. Well, not isolated, it's backward pawn. Pawn on b5 isn't too good either. So, okay, knight a3. So he's, he's making like a, a good effort to develop his pieces and stuff, but he's not doing it in a very coherent way. And his position is going to start to crumble. Now, castling here is very logical and we're going to do it. Um, and we should now kind of think about what our subsequent plan is going to be. What do we even attack here? So the knight, knights are very bad. The knights are on the rim. There's many good plans in this position. So I'll highlight two separate ideas. The first is on the queen side. The second is on the king side. So what is the biggest target? Let's think in terms of targets. The biggest target on the queen side is the pawn on c3. What is a very typical and very solid way to attack that pawn? So we go rook c8, occupying the semi-open file. And he can go rook c1, but then his rook is tied down to the protection of the pawn. I've talked about it, this at length previously. The fact that it's not only about winning a pawn, often you can use the weakness of a pawn or the weakness of anything square to tie down your opponent's pieces, which would force them uh, to do nothing but defend that pawn. And then uh, you could reallocate your resources and your opponent often can't reallocate his. Okay. All right. That's right. <laughs> okay. So he's deciding whether to defend this. Now, I mentioned a, a king side target. He does it with a queen. What is the king side target? How do we exploit it? So the target is the h3 knight. I've mentioned this previously. We can think, well, how can I go about attacking that knight and preparing the attack? Uh, there's many, again, there's so many good moves here. I almost struggle to, to decide myself. But a very typical maneuver is getting this queen to h5, right? Uh, often this is seen in certain Sicilian lines with white. Uh, but this is a, a maneuver that's as old as the hills. It assembles the pieces on the king side. It will attack the knight and it will create potential for an attack. By the way, when I'm playing solidly with black, that, that's not to say I'm not going to ever attack the king. I'm going to do what the position demands, but you guys can see that I'm making like a, I'm making certain choices that are, uh, that are more solid, that are more uh, development based. Um, and hopefully that's, that's turning out decently. Okay, so rook c1, we're going to complete the maneuver, queen h5. And he has really only one move. He's got to find king g2, bringing the king up, supporting the knight. But that is just, you know, his position is really on its last legs. I hope he finds it because it's going to give us a chance to, to think instructively in that subsequent position. So let me walk you through, he finds it, what I'm seeing in this position. Now, what I'm seeing is this bishop on f4. You guys are also seeing it. What am I seeing about it? Well, this bishop's pathway back is blocked by the queen. It's only out is the knight on e5, right? Are you on the same page about this? So, and but, but when I start looking at this knight, I'm like, wait a second. Maybe I could try to go knight c4, right? Attack the queen, and then I could go e5 or g5. Uh, but there's an issue with that too, which is that this a3 knight, it, it may seem bad, but it's actually con contesting that c4 square. So working back one more step, what move can we come up with to enable knight c4? Yeah, bishop c5. Bishop c5 attacks the knight. I hope you guys followed the logic there. The knight's going to move. Then we go knight c4 attacking the queen. And then 
this bishop no longer has that exit path by taking the knight, we can attack the bishop and either trap it right off the bat or make a further dent in white's defensive resources. So notice how flexible we are. At first, we were attacking the c-pawn, but we stop on a dime, we switch gears, we again do what the position demands of us. Nobody um, you know, says that your play has to be totally consistent from the first move to the last. And he plays a very nice move, queen b2, actually. He, this guy is, 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 he's not bad, he's not easy to beat. Now, this is actually not, this doesn't actually stop our, our threat, right? What can we do? We can play, and I'm gonna speed up just a little bit. We can take the remove the defender, right? It's painful to, to part ways with our bishop, which was a really nice bishop, but I believe that the effect of knight c4 is going to be so vast that it's going to uh, make it okay to give up that bishop because e5 is gonna be devastating, unless he finds some crazy defensive resource, which I'm not seeing. Okay, he takes on a7, be my guest, e5. Oh, he wants bishop e3. Yeah, no, he's playing well. He's playing well, but it's not gonna help, I think. So after bishop e3, what can we do? Robbie, thank you so much. Yeah, we go d4. So the problem is after bishop e3, if we, if we try to take on e3 and then take again, we're like, ah, work. The queen on a7 is defending that bishop or that pawn. So there's a couple of tactics that come to our aid in that kind of situation. The first is like an interception tactic, or I think it's called interference. Um, and interference is when, you know, there's a connection between two pieces and you break that connection, preferably with tempo. Okay, <laughs> I don't know about that move. I don't know about that move, but... Yes, Carson Wentz instantly found this tactic. I'll treat myself to a candy after this one. All right. He makes it a little bit easier first. But the bishop is still trapped. The fact remains. Okay. Obviously, now we're up a gazillion pieces. But if you want to finish this one clinically... One unstoppable winning plan would be to pile up on this knight even further. What? And I know this sounds ridiculous, like coming up with a plan, we're up 400 pieces. What um, plan can you suggest to pile up on the knight? So knight e3, yeah, okay, let's just go knight e3. You know what? I was thinking about a rook lift. I was thinking about going f5 and then rook f6, rook h6, but that's just, yeah, it's not necessary right now. Let's go knight e3 and just take his rook, take his knight, it's, it's over. Boom. Yeah, so now order of operations. We can take the knight. We can take the rook, it doesn't matter. I'm gonna take the knight because the knight is a stronger attacker than the rook is a defender. We don't need more material. Right now we need to go for checkmate. <laughs> right. And this is one thing that you will see at, at this level. And we'll, we'll see this a lot more at, at like a 13, 1400 level when I reach that rating. Okay, he's really giving us a, a full buffet. I'm gonna take this guy, uh, which is that you'll often see players, you know, competing at a very high level for a long time, but then at some point just collapsing completely. And when there's one small mistake, it often is followed by just like complete total collapse. Okay, so queen c1. I guess I'm not commentating this part of the game and he resigns and we're over 800. Well done, okay, good. That was a well, well played game for sure. All right, so d4, d5. Now, c4 is the queen's gambit declined, right? It's the queen's gambit declined. Uh, and, or no, no, sorry, this is the queen's gambit. We were going to play the queen's gambit declined. By no means do you have to play the queen's gambit declined. Um, dc, the queen's gambit accepted, is perfectly legitimate opening as well. And there's a couple of, well, there's the Slav, which is another form of declining the queen's gambit. And, you know, as some of you may know, there's the Baltic, bishop f5. This is a sideline, but it can be a very dangerous one. I've shown this to Hafu. Knight c6 is the Chigorin. So there's a lot of options for black against the, the queen's gambit. Um, but our opponent played g3. 
So now after knight f6, bishop g2 is, of course, the logical continuation. And here, some players will play as they would in a queen's gambit decline. So they would play e6. But e6 is not the best move. Black can get more out of this position. What would you propose here with black? Yeah, so bishop f5 is the clinical move. Bishop f5 devel develops the bishop outside the pawn chain, right? And this concept, I'll often use this, and you might, well, what do you mean by that? Well, all this means is that after when you play e6, right, the bishop is locked in. If you play bishop f5 first and then play e6, the bishop has made it out. Now you can defend the d5 pawn to your heart's content. This is also the philosophy of an opening like the London, right? So you're basically playing the London system um, against the Catalan or against some sort of weird Fianchetto opening. And white is super solid here. People play like this, but that would be one good way to respond. Not that e6 is bad, but he, he goes bishop h3, we take it. And now we strike in the center with c5. Um, so what would we have done if he had taken immediately? Now, again, recall the term gambit mentality. And gambit mentality applies equally to queen's gambit openings and king's gambit openings. The gambit mentality says that when you sacrifice a pawn or more for activity, you, you, should, you, you should A, be ready to sacrifice even more if that's what's required and b you shouldn't rush to recover the pawn at all costs like queen a5 recovers the pawn at all costs but remember you're not developing your pieces you're moving your queen around a bunch and you're giving your opponent a chance to develop a tempo that would defeat the purpose of the gambit in the first place so a good move here would be e5 um but a more measured idea would also be to play um just knight c6 yeah knight c6 you, you don't need to rush to, to, to uh, get rid of this pawn. If white wants to bend over backwards and save this pawn, let let him do that. Then you're going to have a huge development advantage. You're going to have a beautiful center. You're going to have massive compensation for the pawn. Um, yeah, how did, how did it help us? Well, just visually, you should see that the pawn is displaced, right? The d4 pawn was controlling a central square. It was in the center. Now it's offset to the side of the center. And particularly if we play e5, you'll see this in, in stark relief, the fact that now we have full control over the, the key central squares. Um, but I, I do want to mention, let, let's assume that after knight c6, white would have castled. The move e5 is actually not necessarily the best one, because as I said, this central arrangement um, creates a liability on d5. This pawn is not defended by any other pawn. So what can white do here to soften up black's control of the d5 pawn? And again... This is good for black too, but I just want to illustrate a point here. So c4 is, is possible, but not scary. I can either take on c4, I can move past it. But the move bishop g5 is actually quite nasty in these positions because, um, <laughs> because after bishop c5, bishop f6, you run into an issue where if you take on f6 with the queen and you drop the d5 pawn, if you take with the pawn, well, you know, this is fine, but now you have to reckon with a, your pawn structure on the king's side being ruined. Black is doing it amazingly here. He can castle queen side. But I'm illustrating a general point rather than this position specifically. <laughs> no, I don't know about that, man. I'm flattered. Uh, you're the OG. Okay, so after, let's see. So c5, I hope that makes sense. Gary is gifting to Ben. Ben, thank you. Go, Ben. So bishop e e3, knight c6. Your lessons are just, they're not just fine, they're gold. Um, so after knight c6, again, it's the same thing after dc. We could go e6, we could go e5. So c3, e6, um, just developing normally. d takes c5, he finally takes the pawn. And here we go, knight g4. So I hope this move makes sense. We're just hitting the bishop. A lot of you guys were asking... What happens if he goes bishop d4? And the idea of bishop d4 is that if knight takes d4, he plays cd and he builds a pawn chain. We don't want this. So what should black do here? e5 is correct. Now we go e5, we attack the bishop. Bishop has no squares. Has to go back to e3, we take it. Oh, look at this. And now bishop c5 with an amazing position. Um, I hope that makes sense. So for that reason, bishop g5 was sensible. We go f6 goes bishop f4 
And once again, the temptation here was to play e5, but um, it would have softened up the d5 pawn. I wasn't sure I wanted this. Uh, I think we have enough control of the center here. So the uh, bottom line here, the lesson is controlling the center is, you know, it, it's not something where you do, it, it's, it's a matter of diminishing returns. Like at first, the first two squares that you control is huge, it's important. After everything after that uh, has to be weighed against the negatives. Thank you, Mbase, gifting to Red Gryffindor. Would Bishop B7 be okay? Yeah, it would be fine. But the issue here is that you do allow White the opportunity to cling to the pawn before. And, um, you know, I did just say that Black is still good here. You know, Black is Black has good control of the center, but I didn't want to give him that extra opportunity. If that makes sense. So F6, Bishop C5. And, you know, I think White should have... He had the right idea. At this point, white is already in pretty big trouble, but knight d2 would have been a more central developing square. Would have been better. Knight a3, the knight really is out of commission here. Castles, castles, rook c8. So we attack the pawn. Rook, uh, queen d2. Again, should have played rook c1 probably. Abiding by the rule that you should, you know, you shouldn't use a piece of higher value to do something that you can do with a piece of lower value. Now we go queen e8. Getting the queen around to h5. Rook a c1, queen h5, and he finds king g2. But now this key move, bishop c5, trying to open up the c4 square for the knight so that we can then set in motion the e or the g-pawn and uh, cause tremendous difficulty to this bishop. I abide all the time. So I wanted to show one really, really cool tactic. If he had moved his knight back and we had gone knight c4, and then he brought his queen up to d3. I have two questions for you guys. First of all, if you did, did decide to attack this bishop between e5 and g5, which should be preferred? So we're split. Uh, the answer is g5. Yeah, e5 drops the d5 pawn with check, unfortunately. That's why I always say when you make a move like this in the center, you have to understand what's been left behind, what is no longer protected. Whereas Robert says, what changes as a result of the last move, particularly with very committal moves that should be checked? Uh, no pun intended. And we drop the knight, drop the pawn to check. It's not good. But black has also, in addition to e, uh, g5, a very pretty tactical idea. I'll tell you the first um, of those, of the moves. Bishop takes f2. Looks pretty wild, right? Well, first of all, you might say, well, this blunders the bishop. But that opens up the queen's path to h2. And then we drop the knight back with a fork. But white can try to be smarter than that and play rook takes f2, right? You can try to get two pieces for the rook. And in this position, black has a very pretty tactical concept. Does anybody see it? And I will show you guys this time the uh, one of the, the most famous applications of this exact pattern, uh, very famous, and uh, finale to a game. Um, which I will find as you guys ponder its move. Yeah, queen h3 is right. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all right, and I found the game. I just gotta set up, let me, let me first show the concept itself. So uh, queen h3, drawing the king into h3, then taking the rook with a fork. And if you count the material at the end of it, black has an extra exchange. Now, how did I know to look for this? Well, let's take a quick peek at a famous finale. Okay, this is not ideal alignment, but it'll do. Petrosian against Spassky in their World Championship match 1966. So this whole game was very famous. We won't, and Spassky is literally behind me. Isn't that pretty meta? Behind me, I'm resigning to Spassky here. Spassky will be resigning to Petrosian um, 38 years before I resigned to Spassky. Um, and it is white to play and win. So who sees the combination? Okay, a lot of you guys are seeing the right idea. But you've got to be very careful about the execution. Queen h8 is the right idea, but after king takes h8, you need whole board awareness right here. You're like, yeah, I'm winning the queen back. I'll have two pieces for a rook in a winning endgame. No, rook takes f7. The rook emerges out of nowhere and takes the knight. 
So first, you have to take the uh, the rook with the bishop. Uh, Spassky recaptured. Now you play queen h8, drawing the king into h8, luring the king, and now knight takes f7. He resigned after queen h8. Fork. And at the end, we're simply a piece up in the end game. So Spassky resigned after queen h8. Who's... Who said that Petrosian uh, never had cool combinations? That's absolutely untrue. Yeah, that knight on a5 is, is not a good one. <laughs> That's for sure. This was a King's Indian, by the way. Okay. Um, so that is sort of a, a similar pattern. You can, I think, and this is a pretty common tactical idea. It's, it's not the only game where this happened. Um, but hopefully it, it helps you remember this concept. Um, and queen b2 was our opponent's move. We take the knight, we go knight c4. And here we, we go e5 because the d5 pawn is no longer hanging. Okay. Had he, uh, he went queen c5, but had he gone bishop e3, we would have gone d4. Right. Oh, I think Magnus might be up there. And this is an interference tactic because if he takes, then we take on e3 and we win the rook, we win the knight. And black white's position collapses. That's not the only move. Um, you could also try a move like rook to a8, but the queen could try to be stubborn here and cling to this bishop. And also now it's attacking d5 with check. So um, this is, I think, a little bit imprecise. And I'm actually not sure what black can do here to win the game quickly. I mean, black can just go rook fd8 or something. And of course, we're still dominating, but uh, but, but that would be the, the difficulty of that. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the bottom line. Well, he went queen c5, we take it and the game is over. I think it's time I hit the sack, guys. It's been, well, it's already been a five-hour stream almost. Um, let's play one Encore game. One more. One last one. And uh, then we'll, we'll wrap up for today. Okay. So let's get that last game on the road, Arbadika. Okay. So E3. We've already faced one... Reverse French. Uh, we've already faced one reverse French. Um, okay, this time he goes queen to e2. That is that is not a good move because it blocks the bishop from from developing, right? It blocks the bishop from developing. And uh, our response to these kinds of moves is one and the same. We, we go down the checklist. Do we, can we control the center? Uh, can, we, can we get our pieces out? And, here we can do both. We can control the center with d5, and then we can start getting our pieces out. And this would, yeah, so now he goes e4. So the question here is, should we, should we take on e4? Should we take on e4, should we go d4, or should we ignore? So what we shouldn't do is go d4. So as I explained yesterday, d4 closes up the center. And when you close up the center, you lessen the effect of a development advantage. It becomes harder to exploit a development advantage because the center is closed, it's more clogged up, and uh, it's harder to get anything done. So in, in reality, you should try to open up the center as quickly as possible because he's done nothing but move his queen. And a development advantage, while we don't have one yet, we are about to have one because his queen is going to be stuck in the, in, the, in the middle. So let's take the pawn, right? Let's take the pawn. Now we go knight c6, we develop the knight and defend e5. Then we might go knight f6 with tempo. We, by the way, could have gone knight f6 immediately and actually sacrificed this one in order to open up the e-file, but we're trying to play more solidly, so no need for that. We might sacrifice the pawn at some point if he goes bishop e5, for example. So does the logic here make sense, right? We, we welcome an opening of the center. Knight f6 would have been good too. Knight f6 would have been good too. Uh, but I just want to illustrate the general logic here. D takes e4 is, is, I think, more pure from that point of view. Okay. So again, f5, would not only would it lose the e-pawn, the issue with a move like f5 is it doesn't get a piece out. It actually weakens the king. And again, I think you're making this move because you, hey, oh, I'm attacking the queen. It's with tempo. But the move itself has to accomplish something. It's not enough for a move to attack your opponent's queen. Uh, the move has to accomplish something apart from that. Okay, knight f3. Now we go knight f6, right? e5 pawn is defended, and he can't take it with a knight because we take his queen. And we got royalty in the chat. Maybe I should have gone f6, just to take some, some grandmasters off. 
All right. Queen c4. So he's throwing more oil onto the fire. He's allowing us to continue developing with tempo. How can we do that? There should be sixes, right? Yep. He should have probably just gotten his queen back to ASAP. Now the development advantage becomes scary. Now the development advantage becomes scary. This is the last game. Right? Why is he not developing his speed? Well, he's he's moving his queen around. I mean, his queen is attacked. So, you know, it's, okay, so queen e2, which is correct. Now there's two approaches here. I can guarantee you that some, I'm sure that some of you are thinking about e4, attacking the knight. But let's be very, let's be almost obsessive in this case, about completing our, in this case, I think we should be obsessed about completing our, completing our development. And we should also tempt him into taking the pawn on e5. So I'll, ex I'll talk about moves like knight before afterward. So let's get this bishop out. Where should we put it? Forget for a second about defending this pawn. If, if that wasn't on our priority list, where would you put the bishop? Yeah, bishop c, <laughs> yeah, exactly. He just illustrated it. So bishop c5. Now, why are we not concerned about taking the pawn? Because our development advantage has reached biblical proportions. Um, and upon taking the pawn on e5 would actually help us open up the e-file and it would hasten his demise. Okay, so he goes b3. Tries to get out the bishop. He's not going to have time for it. Now, we could castle, but at this point, we've gotten all of our miners out. We could also play that move e4, which would be much stronger now that we've developed all of our miners. Let's do it, let's go e4, right? So why are we not castling? Why are we not worried about it? Well, he's, he doesn't have any of the resources necessary to punish us for not castling. He doesn't have any pieces out at all. I still would have preferred castling, but you know, this is a fun move and it's the last game of the day, so let's have some fun. Okay, and I'll, I'll, I know there's, you know, a lot of you have specific questions, like why didn't we go here or there? That always happens when we've got these games. And again, please note that there are many good moves in a position like this, really. And you shouldn't get too uh, upset about like, why didn't we do this? Like, you know, I don't get why this was, it probably means your move was good too. Now, what should we do? Now we can just go after him. At this point, he's so underdeveloped that we can just go after him. We can go knight d4 and you know, Am I being hypocritical here? Am I making a move just because it attacks the queen? No, well, I'm centralizing the knight. I'm also hitting c2, I'm forcing the queen back. Literally, okay, well, I'm not forcing the queen back, but it would have been a good idea to put it, put it back. Now we take it. And I'll talk about what we would have done there after the game. And this game is over. All right. And he's probably not feeling too hot right now. Yeah, I mean, again, these people don't know, this, you know, <laughs> yeah. Okay, knight c3. So we can take on c3. We can also return to d4 to attack the pawn. And uh, goes d3, now we take with a fork. I'm gonna go a little bit faster through this final stage of the game. I think you guys get the point. Knight takes a1. And um, the game is over. Well, I mean, the games end quickly, but I think when you are a beginner, the opening is the most important stage of the game. So it's, it's not a bad thing that the game is end quickly. Uh, you know, and when we... Okay, so Bishop B2 is good. You know, he's winning the knight. There's, there's many approaches here. Uh, in such situations, by the way, when you do get your knight trapped, the classic approach is how can we give this knight up for as much as possible, right? If we're already losing our knight, how can we take out as much material as possible? It's not as necessary to do this here because we're already up a queen and a rook, but uh, I'll still do it, right? Knight takes b3. We can give the knight up for two pawns. We can shatter his queen side and we can pull the king out. So this would be... Um, this would be what you would do if, like, you know, if you weren't up a gazillion pieces, 
Okay, now he lets us pull our knight out to d4. And uh, yeah, he's he's probably going to resign. Bishop f5 is coming in. Just going to let's just take the pawn. Let's just open up the position. Castle. Now we are going to castle, right? It, it bothers me that our king is still in the center. Something about that is pushing my buttons. Castles. Yeah. Now we should notice that we're skewering his king. Let's take the knight, whatever. I'm I'm playing very fast here, guys. There's not there there isn't very much to explain here. This is a battery, and we are attacking f2. And then after knight d1, we go queen g4 check. Okay, let's take this guy. And now the king and the bishop are on the same file, so we're gonna bring the rook into the game and win the bishop. So a battery is when you stack one piece on another piece, but both like in the direction of that first piece. Like if you stack a rook and a bishop up on top of each other, that's not a battery, right? Um, if you put a queen and a bishop in a diagonal, that's a battery. If you put a queen and a rook in a file, that's a battery. Rook takes c3 check. Um, queen e1 is coming in, queen d1, and then knight e4. So queen takes e1 is right, king takes d3, queen d1 check, and then knight e4 is checkmate. Knight e4 is checkmate. Yeah. Okay. Good game. So... The bottom line here is that um, after e3, e5, queen e2, d5, e4, he takes e4. Um, yeah, this is already bad. Like, this is bad enough. This opens up the center, and now we're just developing our pieces, developing our pieces. Uh, bishop e6. The only thing I really want to mention is what would have happened if knight takes e5? Well, we would have taken the knight. There's two approaches here. There is a tactical move that wins the pawn back with great effect. That's the best move. What is Black's best move here? What am I talking about? If you've done your puzzles, you'll see this quickly. That's bishop f6. All right, good night. Bishop, oh, sorry, bishop takes f2. And if he takes, then that's a fork against the queen. If the king moves, well, then the king has lost castling rights. But even if we drop the bishop back and then castle, chances are he's going to get in big trouble because of the development advantage. So e1, b3, we go e4. If he had dropped his queen back, we would have sizzled his queen with bishop g4. This is absolutely, I mean, look at this position. Crushing. And we could even play bishop f3, you know, give him a like this. But we can also just castle and, and do a bunch of different things here. So um, I'll definitely talk more at length about converting these kinds of advantages when you're like crushing. How do you actually find the crushing move? But uh, you cannot castle while in check, and you cannot castle through a check. But after queen b5, everything was very, very straightforward. So anyways, guys, um, what if you, they try to block your bishop with f3? So if f3, then we take on f3. And again, as in many of these positions, we can move the knight away anywhere, even to e4, and threaten the queen h4 checkmate. And again, four pieces against zero. And this is absolutely demo, de this is absolute demolition. Okay, um, so let's call it a night. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get some shut eye. It's uh, again, very, very early start tomorrow. Um, and uh, hope you guys enjoyed. We're, we're 8.45 right now in, on the speed run. Uh, and I think when we get to like 1,000, 1,100, the games will start to get longer. But for the time being, we're, we're, we're working on mastering those opening principles. Um, thank you everybody so much for the support. Uh, we're on the doorstep of 6,000 subs. I really appreciate that.